Presenting for us today is Dr. Anthony Konya. He is the president of Precision Blasting and Academy Blasting TV. He is a uh, Precision Blasting Services is a blast engineering firm that specializes in helping mining and construction clients improve and optimize their drilling and blasting performance. He is also the owner, uh, the president and owner of Academy Blasting TV, as I mentioned before developer of the modern pre-splitting theory and design practices under the, pre under the precision pre-splitting applications that's now been accepted by companies all over the world. He has over 100 technical publications in drilling and blasting. He's taught at the Colorado School of Mines in their explosives engineering department and at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, Dr. Konya has a bachelor's in mining and a master's and a PhD in explosives engineering. Strayos is a cloud-based software company that develops aerial intelligence, artificial intelligence, and augmented intelligence solutions for the drilling, blasting, and mining industries. Formed in 2016, Strayos is used in hundreds of sites across the world. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Anthony Konya. Thank you, Kim, and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar here based on Violence Factor, a new KPI for the drilling and blasting industry. Um, I know Kim gave a great introduction there. I'll just go through um, a brief background on me. So I'm the president of Precision Blasting Services. We do explosives engineering work all across the world and are based out of the United States in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm the CEO and founder of Konya Mining Company. We are an aggregate mining company that uh, services the Midwestern markets with sand, gravel, crushed stone. I'm the president of academyblasting.com, which is an online education uh, platform for the drilling and blasting and explosives engineering space. As Kim mentioned, I have a PhD in explosives engineering. I'm an inducted member into the Institute of Explosives Engineers. I developed the modern pre-split theory, which was published in, I believe, 2019 or 2020 on uh, the new mechanics and design parameters around a technique called precision pre-splitting. I have over 100 technical publications and I've worked throughout the US and all 50 states and across the world on just about every continent in surface underground and construction blast design, uh, various different types of explosives engineering, vibration control, underwater blasting, designing and developing explosive manufacturing plants, um, and various other areas in the explosives and mining space. What we're gonna be talking about here today is a way that we can go about very quickly analyzing a blast and determining in general, if it is a well-functioning blast that has good performance, or if there's ways that we could improve that blast. Today's lecture is not necessarily gonna be based on how we make improvements to the blast, but we will highlight some things that we know do link up with uh, worse blasting results. And so the way I always like to start this is by asking, what is a good blast? And we can see a picture right here. This is a blast mid detonation, and there's really a lot going on here. And we're just gonna take a moment to break down some of the things that we can see. Now, the first thing you can see is the stemming in these boreholes is ejecting. And we can see that with these rifled plumes going back and forth across the bench here. Now, this stemming ejection has nothing to do with what we call violence factor. And we'll be getting into the terms, the description of violence factor. This stemming ejection is just that, it's stemming ejection. If we look into the background though, we can see that the rock in this bench is actually breaking upward. And you can see bits of rock here. That's not from the stemming, that's actually the bench cratering and moving upward into the air. And what you can see is this bench here is cratering upward and barely moving out in the burden. So we can see the breakage here and there is some movement in the burden, but not a significant amount. And the question is, why does this happen? And that's gonna be a lot of what we're gonna focus on is, first off, is this a proper breakage mechanism? And is that a good blast? What are the results of that? And what are some of the reasons it happens? Now, I've heard several people, I, I always give this as a lecture uh, or this picture I use in my lectures at the various universities. And I always ask students after they've gone through their, their first introduction to blasting, well, why are we getting blowout and vertical breakage here? 
And the number one answer I get is that the stemming in this situation is poor. That may be the case, but when you look at this closer, we can see a couple other things. And this is where it's important that um, we understand the mechanisms behind what's happening and why some of these things may occur. If we have stemming blowout and that's it, as I mentioned, that doesn't necessarily fall under violence factor. But what are we really seeing in this blast? Well, we can see here we have rows of holes that run parallel to this free face here. And we can see here that the back holes, this would be the furthest back rows, are ejecting about the same as the front are. And we notice that there's no burden movement here before the back rows of this blast are actually firing. So in this example here, this is not a stemming issue. This is a timing issue. And what's happening here is we're having over confinement of these charges. We're not relieving the free face before the second row fires, yet alone before the first row fires. And we're seeing very minimal movement in the burden and breakage in the burden. And the only place the rock back here has to go is straight up vertically into the air. And because of that, we'd say that it's over confined and it's cratering. And that's really what we're gonna talk about here today is what is cratering? Why is it not an ideal breakage mechanism? How can we define the extent of that cratering using a term called violence factor? And what in general do we believe that that means for our blast? And so I always start with, well, what is a good blast? Well, the first is a good blast is one that is well fragmented rock. What does that mean? Well, in the majority of cases, it means we have minimal boulders, we have a small percentage of fines, and the rock is all in a similar size range. So this is a very general definition of fragmentation. And that's because when we're looking across the board at blasting, whether we're in construction, quarrying, open pit metal mining, coal mining, we have different requirements for all of these, but each site has a certain description, direction, or identification of what is a boulder, what is a fine, and where they want their rock at. The material has to be well placed. And again, this is gonna be highly dependent on the type of environment we're blasting in. In a construction project, we may have small equipment and we may need to blow that rock and scatter it across the site. So that way we can easily dig it and we don't encounter a safety hazard digging on a high pile. Conversely, in a big copper mine or gold mine, we may wanna have that material piled up so that the larger equipment we're using can easily dig it and get proper fill factors on their bucket. And so again, this is very subjective based on the type of environment, but it is one of the key parameters for the performance of the blast that we need to ensure we're hitting so that way whatever equipment's being used can be used efficiently and safely. A good blast is one which has low ground vibration. Now, what, what does low ground vibration mean? I always hesitate on using the term minimal because there's almost always something we can do to further lower the ground vibration or reduce that level. When we say low ground vibration, what that means is we're below the required ground vibration to avoid damaging structures, residences, industrial sites, whatever's in that nearby vicinity. And it's the same thing with air overpressure. We're aiming for low air overpressure that's not gonna cause damage, or in some cases, annoyance to nearby neighbors. We want safe conditions, no fly rock, minimal back break so we don't leave large boulders stuck on the free face that'll eventually roll out or fall down. We want a blast which meets state, federal, local regulations. And after we've achieved all of those, we wanna hit the lowest cost for those results. And really this is the list that every blaster should be thinking of and going through as they're designing and laying out their blasts is how do we ensure that we meet all of these conditions? Now today our blasting has been able to improve and progress. And this is another example. This is just a different view of that previous blast. Again, you can see all of these holes are firing and blowing out before this free face has even begun to move there. Now today we have lots of different systems. We have fragmentation systems, 3D bench profiling, drones for different borehole locations, drones for 3D profiling. And all of those are wrapped up in the packages today like Strayos has where you can use all of them and integrate them. We have borehole scopes 
that we can actually detect how that borehole is progressing and what the drill deviation is. And the biggest thing we're going to be using here for this violence factor is going to be video cameras and drone videos. They're some of the simplest systems. Almost every blast should have one of these systems employed. So that way we can actually see how the blast is performing. Because, for example, in this shot here, again, we can tell where the problems are lying. And we can see that, yes, the stemming may have ejected, which when we're looking at a blast very quickly in less than a second on the bench, as it detonates, we may see the stemming ejection, but we may not be able to pick up the fact that, well, the burden's not moving, all of these holes are over confined, and we can see there's no movement or breakage in the majority of this bench by the time this line of holes here has fired. And that's why we like to use different video cameras or drone videos to capture that data and be able to go back and review it afterwards. Now, this is an example of a blast that I was on over in the Middle East. And you can see there, the blast was very quickly timed and we had a tremendous amount of blowout there. Now, this was the blast before I got to the project. We'll go on into a case study here uh, later. And this is another blast here. This is an aggregate operation up in Canada. And you can see the blast is just smoothly breaking and rolling out there. And at the end of the day, we can take a still frame of both of these and we can see the one blast that's blowing out versus the other blast that's smoothly rolling on the ground. And we can take a look at both of these and compare and go, which shot do we think performed better? And this is the whole background on violence factor. It's really nothing that's inherently new. Blasters for decades have understood that a good blast is one that's controlled. It rolls out smoothly, it falls into the pit, it has good breakage and it's not causing fly rock to go up into the air um, well above the bench. And all we've done here with violence factor is given a way to rate these blasts and line it up with the potential performance that we believe that the shot will get. So let's take a look at cratering. Really what we're doing is describing cratering and how much a blast craters. Now, cratering is a poor breakage mechanism, which gives uncontrollable results and typically causes bad blasts. And we're gonna take a look here at a video. This is a training event with the Illinois Labor Union. And the goal of this blast was to give laborers hands-on training abilities to go drill and load holes. And at the labor site here, they wanted a new pond added. So our job was to, in a training environment, let them blast a new pond. Fire. And there you can see the cratering of that pond going up. And you can see here they're measuring the crater out. 33, how long? 32 feet wide. And you can see here the guys are reaching up in the, uh, the bottom of this crater, and it's about an eight foot crater. So what we see there is a 33 by 32 or 33 foot circular crater that's about eight feet deep. Now this crater was shot with a series of four holes on the top, augered down into this dirt, and it was at a five foot depth. That's where the charges were placed at about five feet deep. So we can see that with this cratering, we broke well out from where those holes are. We broke equally around all of the charges and we broke below the charges. And this is common. In fact, if we look at, let's say the military textbooks on cratering, which the military uses a tremendous amount of cratering, we can see exactly how they define a crater. You can see right here, this is where, and I'll draw it on the slide, this right here, this red dot, that's where the charge is placed. You can see we get breakage below grade, so we're breaking below the charge. We're breaking equally in a 360 degree circle around the charge, and you can see we have back break on either side we're causing not just fragmentation, but fracturing of the rock both below and on all sides. And then we have some type of elastic zone where there's minor damage around that, again, going below the charge and going in a 360 degree arc around the site. Now imagine if right here, where this orange line is, we had another set of holes and that was gonna fire after this red one did. Well, if we have cratering, this is where we can start to encounter column shifts. This is where we can break through the top of the stemming for the adjacent hole and cause fly rock. 
And also, this is where we can start to, I'm trying to find my cursor here. This is where we can start to have problems with throwing fly rock far distances, again, because we uh, now have a reduced burden on the remainder of this charge, which is even below our stemming zone. Now, conversely, if we have, let's say we space these holes out through experience and we're still trying to crater the shot like this. And let's say we put another set of bore holes out here where this blue one is. That way they're far enough away that we're outside of this major crater zone from where this red line of holes would have been. Well, now this hole may crater something like this. And you're gonna have to excuse my drawing skills. I uh, never claim to be an artist here. But let's say it cratered something like this. Well, now in this region here, we're gonna get very fine fragmentation. And let's say this was the plane we were trying to blast to. What do you notice about this region in here? There's very little fragmentation. There's maybe some fracturing and that's gonna be extremely hard digging. There's gonna be boulders left there in the bottom of the shot. And that's where we may get a poor floor where we end up leaving a toe in between holes. And as you can start to see, when we go through the mechanisms of cratering, we're starting to understand why certain things can happen in the blast and why when we see a lot of violent vertical blasting, why we're seeing some of these results where we have fines mixed with boulders, why we get toes at the bottom of grade, why we cause back break to the bench, why the rock is fractured behind the bench and into the free face of the next shot. So we know cratering, as I mentioned, will lead to boulders and fines forming. We know that the material is going to be scattered. We're going to have a lot of material blown up in the air here. We're going to have high ground vibration because this is over confined and there's no free burden. We're going to have high air overpressure because all that sound, noise, and energy is going upward. And as the top of that shot lifts vertically, we're going to cause an, a new air overpressure wave to form above the blast. We're going to have that significant back break behind the shot. We know we're going to get breakage below grade, and depending on the type of geology, we can get very significant breakage below grade. And this is really where we started looking at violence factor. And violence factors, a key performance indicator or a KPI that is now being added to blast reports across multiple different industries. The U.S. Department of Defense has now rolled it out on multiple different projects. We've seen a lot of private industry jobs rolling it out, state highways, and what they're doing is requiring the contractors or the blasting company to actually denote this in their blast log. So videotape the blast, take the video, see how it rates on a violence factor scale, and report that so that way we can track and monitor violence factors across projects and across blasts. And Violence Factor was created by our firm. We looked at over 18,000 different blast holes all over the world in different mining and construction scenarios. We analyzed the videos and the Violence Factor ratings that we could give to these different uh, blasts, and then looked at the results in ground vibration, air overpressure, fragmentation, heave, and we correlated that to this new Violence Factor. Now, Violence Factor is nothing uh, difficult to calculate. There's no complex equations. There's no calculus involved. It's very simply a comparison of the vertical movement of rock above the blast to the actual bench height. And this is how it's calculated. Let's say we have a bench and let's say that bench is 30 feet, approximately 10 meters. If the rock does not vertically displace above that bench, that would be a violence factor of zero. Now, when we're talking about vertical displacement, we're not talking about a rolling of the bench where it just gently rolls and swells and puffs out. We're talking about that cratering look where we actually see rock, individual rocks leaving the top of the bench. If we have none of that, that would be a violence factor of zero. If we have vertical displacement less than one half the bench height, so that 30 foot, 10 meter bench, if we have less than 15 feet or five meters of vertical uplift, that would be a violence factor of one. Somewhere between half and one times the bench height, so between 15 to 30 feet or half a meter to 10 meter, that is a violence factor of two. Vertical displacement between one and two times the bench height, so 30 to 60 feet or 10 to 20 meters, that's a violence factor of three. 
and then vertical displacement over two times the bench height. So on that 30 foot, 10 meter bench, if we have rock that goes over 60 feet or 20 meters, in that case, we have a violence factor of four. Anything above that point stays as a violence factor of four. And the reason is, is at two times the bench height, we no longer see a change or worsening of blast performance results, whether it's two times or 10 times. We've hit that sort of worst case scenario, except in fly rock. And fly rock, we're gonna rate under different mechanisms. There's other ways to look at how far fly rock's gonna travel or the potential effects of fly rock. But all of the other mechanisms, the ground vibration, air overpressure, fragmentation, at that point, we've already hit our worst case scenario when we're at a violence factor of four. And so we're gonna look at a series of different blasts from around the world here um, that our company has worked on. And uh, in many of these cases, you know, we are the engineering firm. So some of these blasts I'll show you are from when we got to the site, we're analyzing what's going on. Others are from groups that we've worked with. And uh, we're gonna take a look and go through and rate these different blasts and their violence factor. And you can see here, this was a blast that was down in South America, and one of our colleagues was down there uh, videotaping the blast, and they had some fly rock that came pretty close to where they were standing. If you saw, there was a lot of stone being thrown into this puddle here. And so this, this blast here, we're rating a violence factor of two because we had those holes blow out in the back approximately equal to one times the bench height. And it doesn't matter if the entire bench blows vertically or to just a few holes, we're still gonna, we, what we see is those few holes typically dictate or lead the trend of the blast. So in ground vibration and air overpressure, it's normally those holes which are blowing out that are gonna be the major contributors to the ground vibration and air overpressure. Here's another blast. This is from a construction project in California. It's right at the bottom of a lock here. And you can see that blast nicely rolls. It swells up. It breaks the material. You can see afterwards, it's a very well done blast. There's no real cap rock there. Everything's nicely broken. And this would have a violence factor of zero. Again, the bench rolls a bit. It swells up on top but there's no rock being thrown into the air or cratering on the shop. Here's another example. This is a construction project in North Carolina. And let's watch the blast. So again, you can see a very well done controlled blast. It gently rolls. This is in an extremely urban environment. There was buildings within a couple hundred feet on all sides of this blast. And the goal was just to roll that shot, break it up, and it was easily dug out afterwards. Again, a violence factor of zero. We see it gently rolls, but there's no real vertical uplift. Let's take a look at another one here. Now, this is an aggregate operation in Canada. You'll see this is actually a sinking cut. They have a ramp here that is being kept and you'll see the blast detonating back here. Blasting at 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Fire and hold. And so, this is a violence factor of one here. This is a sinking cut. You can see it's a very well executed sinking cut, but there is still some vertical uplift in places, but it's relatively minor. So this would be considered a violence factor of one is still considered a well controlled blast. And you can see even on sinking cuts, we can see that we can achieve these low violence factors where we're not blowing rock all over, it gently rolls moves, and then we can go and excavate the material. This is an uh, example here. This is a copper project down in New Mexico. Now we can see in the back of this shot, there was some vertical uplift. 
Well, that was not a production blast in the back. And let's watch that video again. You'll notice these back holes here were an air deck shot. So it was an attempt at overbreak control. Let's rewatch the video and ignore the air decking or overbreak control because we don't rate violence factor for overbreak control, like pre splitting, air decking, trim blasting. We're just looking at it for production blasting. So let's watch this again and really focus in on that production blast that's right here. And so this would be a violence factor of zero. Maybe it's a violence factor of a one. There was a hole there that looked like it blew out a little bit. Um, but remember, the, the importance here is we're not rating pre-splits or air decks or anything like that with violence factor. This is just from um, the actual production blast. Let's take a look at another example here. This is a diamond mine in Canada. There is the production blast. And again, you can see vertical uplift and rock falling all around there. And so this would be rated a violence factor of four. Again, we had that major vertical blowout and uplift. And if you looked, especially in the back, we had a lot of vertical cratering occurring there. And so as we talked, what we're really assessing with violence factor is what is the breakage mechanism that we're seeing here. And what we want to do is we want to be able to take a quick look at this blast, let's say a blast video, assess what the violence factor is there, and then be able from that to tell our breakage mechanism and then our expected performance, both in the shot and in regards to environmental. So a violence factor of zero or one, there almost identical, they're very similar. We always wanna aim for that zero, but a violence factor of one is still normally considered a fairly good blast. Both of these are breaking through what we call flexural failure with axisymmetric bending. All that means is that the bench is gonna bend outward and it's gonna bend evenly where the middle's the fastest moving and the top and bottom are moving at the same rate. Both of these are gonna give us good performance and they give us consistent and low ground vibration and air overpressure. So if we're blasting with a violence factor of zero or one, and let's say we're putting together a linear regression to predict our ground vibration. Well, in that case, we would expect every single shot to produce more consistent results. Instead of having that large shotgun plot, we'd expect the ground vibration and air overpressure to be tighter and more similar to individual blasts if we compared them on a scale distance basis. When we get to a violence factor of two, that's when we start to see what's known as flexural failure, which means the bench is still bending, but we see it now with cantilever bending. What that means is the bench is bending, but it's likely the top is falling or moving faster than the bottom is. And what that the reason this has a violence factor of two is as that bench starts to break away and that top moves faster, we start to see more material coming upward and shearing vertically. This leads to an increase in boulders. We can leave a toe at the grade because we're not pushing or moving that toe as, frequent, uh, as quickly. We get minor back break, which can go up to about one times the burden. So if you have a 10 foot burden, you could expect up to 10 feet of back break if you have a violence factor of two. Now, one of the biggest causes I've seen where we have these violence factors of two, typically it's a well-designed blast, but the biggest mistake is that the toe burden is not considered. So in a lot of these situations where we see violence factors of two, the actual toe burden for that front row, let's say our design burden's 10 feet and maybe at the toe it's 15 to 20 feet. And we start to see where that cantilevering mechanism occurs because the top is moving faster than the bottom, the bottom's taking longer to break, and material starts to go upward, but it's not that full violent upward blast. This is going to give us moderate PPV, moderate ground vibration, and moderate air overpressure. Again, we're venting upward, 
we have over confinement in certain places and we're seeing increases in our environmental effects. There's gonna be also more variability in the ground vibration and air overpressure. So it starts to become harder to predict what the ground vibration or the maximum ground vibration may be when we have these violence factors of two. Now, if we get to a violence factor of a three or a four, that is a telltale sign that we have cratering occurring. This is now going to be high rock flying into the air. It's going to be violent blasts. And we can see with a violence factor of four, we would estimate that we would have terrible fragmentation with a mix of boulders and fines. Now, if you look at the blast with a violence factor of four immediately after the blast, you're not necessarily gonna see that bad fragmentation. Because again, you have to remember that we are breaking like this with a violence factor of four blast, where these holes are breaking down to some level and the top is all going up in the air. And what do we see? Well, we see the cap rocks breaking. We see that material is gonna be thrown vertically, but and it's gonna be very fine because there's a lot of very rapid movement on it. But this area here in between the holes is gonna be boulders. And so what we need to do is take a holistic approach to fragmentation. It's like if we're using, let's say a software like Strayos and we're gonna fly a drone, take a fragmentation model. We don't necessarily just wanna do that once after the blast because that doesn't paint the entire picture of what's happening there. We wanna see throughout that entire shot what is that fragmentation as we dig? And if you look at it in a holistic manner from the top and through the pile as we're digging, you'll see that these violence factors of force end up with that terrible fragmentation. We get a lot of boulders, we get a lot of fines, and we have a very small window of rock in the middle. We also would expect severe breakage below grade. As I showed you previously, we see that breaking underneath the blast holes. Now, severe breakage, we're not talking about necessarily hundreds of feet, but we could get a few feet below grade there uh, for sure. And depending on the rock type, we can get up to five to 10 feet, or let's say one and a half to three meters of breakage below grade uh, if we have the right jointing and the right bedding planes in the rock. We would also expect um, toes to be left between holes. Again, we, we don't get much breakage in between. We may have some fractures here but this is gonna be tight digging. And when your loader operator comes in to try to dig that out, they're gonna complain that it's very tough, hard rock. Now, when you watch the loader dig and you look afterwards, it may be broken up. And the reason is, is remember, we have that fracture zone on the sides of all of this. So with this cratering, we may have some fractures in there, depending on how close these holes are and how close those fractures come but it's not gonna move. So the loader operator is gonna complain about poor breakage and tough digging. But when you look at it from the loader's bucket, it's gonna be well broken material. And that's, that's again, a telltale sign that we're causing fragmentation, but we're or fracturing, but we're not causing fragmentation. And in a violence factor of four, we can see back break over three times the burden. So a 10 foot, three meter burden, we have seen in many cases backbreak of over 30 feet or 10 meters from that. On top of that, we're gonna get extreme ground vibration and air overpressure. If we have this violence factor of four, there's normally more to be done in improving blast design to lower ground vibration and air overpressure than there is in other more advanced techniques to reduce ground vibration and air overpressure. I always tell our clients, there's no point in us doing signature hole studies if you have a violence factor of four, because not only do we have extreme levels, but we have inconsistent results. Almost every blast has widely different air overpressure and peak particle velocity because we're not consistently blasting and we're relying on cratering to actually do the breakage. So let's take a look at the case study. We've spent a lot of time now talking about theory. This is a case study from a project I worked on over in Saudi Arabia. And we're gonna take a look at some of the blasting before we got to the site. These were some of the videos sent to us of what the blasting was. You'll see the blast here. We're gonna look at overburden. We have the exact same performance results, comparisons in the phosphate ore uh, down below. Um, but 
for sake of time, we've cut out those uh, those videos there, and we'll just take a look at the. Overview. see there again that vertical uplift that we're seeing we'll take a look this is another video from that operation and again you can see here all of this material is going straight into the air there's some minor movement on the burn from the first row but the timing is incorrectly done and all of the back of the shot is going vertically into the air now this was a very unique project because the site had certain government imposed restrictions such as a maximum powder factor they were allowed to blast with and the site in all of those cases was already at that maximum the explosive supplier had very limited products this was a highly remote site so there was no changing explosive type it was all used non-electric detonators there was no changing the non-electric detonator series we could change the timing, but there was no electronics or anything like that could be that could be used. Again, very remote operation. We could not change the drill diameter. That was a contractually based item for this mining company that was in here mining for the government. And so we can't change drill diameter. We can't change the type of explosive. We can't change the type of initiator. We obviously can't change the rock. And we now are coming into this situation where we also cannot change the powder factor of the blast. We had to maintain the exact same powder factor that they had. And after a redesign, you'll see our blast fired up here at the top. And you can see there that smoothly rolled out there was no vertical movement. In fact, it barely came up above the bench crest there at all. We'll take another look. This is actually from my cell phone here, and unfortunately I missed the beginning of the blast, but this is a good side angle uh, view. It's gonna be a very quick, just few seconds. You can see in the thumbnail here, the blast is already ongoing. But you can see that blast gently roll out and fall out. There was nothing vertical coming out of that shot. So we're going to compare. We have previous to our arrival, that violence factor of four. Everything's going up in the air. And we can take a look at the redesigned shot there, violence factor of zero. Exact same powder factor between the two of these blasts. They were using bagged info. There was no change in explosive, non-electric detonators for both, no change in the drill diameter, and obviously no change in the rock or the bench height. And this is how the two of these blasts compare. Now, I always like this case study because you can visually see the difference in fragmentation here. You know, if we have, let's say, a 10% improvement to the fragmentation, which is pretty substantial in and of itself, we can't visually see that with the naked eye. We have to use something like Strayos and fly the drones and get the fragmentation curves. And that's a tough teaching tool because now we're comparing fragmentation curves back and forth. But this is the perfect example of this because you can visually see the difference. The fragmentation here was 1000% better than the fragmentation here. In the phosphate ore, we went from over 10% of every single blast being oversized to less than 1% of the material being oversized. Same powder factor, same initiation system, same explosives. The only difference here was a change in the blast design. And it was a holistic change. Everything in there was changed to achieve these results. Um, but again, we had to contractually maintain that same powder factor. You can see here the huge boulders that they got from the blast. You can see here everything is extremely fine. We have a little bit of end break. This is from the last blast that came in. This is right at the edge of the shop. You can see right here, these fractures, that's back break. This blast was back breaking about five and a half meters on every single blast. Here for this blast that had the violence factor of zero, less than half a meter 
of backbreak there. And so again, it shows you the difference in cratering with a violence factor of four versus a proper blast with flexural failure from a violence factor of zero. And so the question comes up, well, what influences viol the violence of a blast? And there's several different things, one of which is called stiffness ratio. And stiffness ratio is a very simple calculation. We take the bench height divided by the burden of the blast. So how high the bench is compared to how wide our actual massive rock we're trying to move is. In general, this is the, the typical table that you see for stiffness ratio. A stiffness ratio of one, so the bench height equal to the burdens, poor and severe. Two, everything's fair. And at four, we get excellent on all of it. And let's take a look at a couple different blasts here. Uh, and we'll take a look then at some data that shows how changes to stiffness ratio impact our violence factor. And so we can see their various different uh, stiffness ratios uh, being shot and some of the violence that occurs from them. And what we found is that a low stiffness ratio, so a short bench compared to the burden, leads to cratering. Violence factors effectively an assessment of cratering. And so that means a low stiffness ratio typically will lead to a high violence factor. And if we look at it on a project basis, in this project here, we analyzed thousands of blasts. And we took a look at the violence factor for benches with a stiffness ratio less than three and violence factor for benches with a stiffness ratio greater than three. Now, these are all different blasts from a single project, the same contractor. There's no influence from our part on this. We came in after the fact, took all the data and then put it together. And they used effectively the almost the same means and methods for every single shot, similar patterns, similar spacing, similar stemming, timing explosives. And what you can see is when we have a short bench, our stiffness ratio is less than three, 35% of our blasts are a violence factor of four, very high violence. 32% are a violence factor of three, again, very high violence. And you'll notice we have no blasts with a violence factor of zero. However, when all that we changed was the bench height, we go from a low bench to a high bench, same burden, same spacing, same means and methods between these two, you'll see now 8% of the blasts had no violence. They performed perfectly. 17% instead of 10%, 11% performed very well. And you'll notice we cut out almost all of the violence factor or cut in half the violence factor of fours while maintaining the three. So what do we see here? As we get above a stiffness ratio of three with the same means and methods compared to a stiffness ratio below three, we significantly improve the blast results and we reduce a significant amount of that cratering. And this is a pure comparison of that stiffness ratio effect on violence factor. We're gonna skip these videos here just for sake of time. We've already seen some of the low stiffness ratio, but we'll, we'll take a look at some of the high stiffness ratio blasts here. And so first we'll look at a sandstone operation in Ohio. And this is aggregate, you'll see it here. This is with a high-speed video. And you can see that gently rolling out there. We're not getting a tremendous amount of vertical movement. And you can see there's power lines nearby. There was a highway right behind the shot there. And you can see a well-executed shot, very minimal amounts of violence. And again, part of this is on the design process. When we look at these sites, we'll come in and help to achieve proper stiffness ratios to get better blast results throughout time. So that way we're not necessarily in, endangering or setting up the site for failure by having too low of a stiffness ratio, which we know is gonna lead to poor performance. <laughs> We'll 
watch a slow motion video of this here in a second. And you can see here the material is very well broken. There's no oversize. And we can see here in the slow motion, all of these rows are firing. And they're being thrown away piece by piece, swelling up, but not vertically blowing out and cratering as they go. And this here, this is the pre-split blast on the side. That's why you're going to see it blow out there. So you can see this shot was a very low violence shot. Again, higher st blast stiffness ratio. Now, one of the other impacts that we see is row-to-row -row timing, and specifically the row-to-row -row timing scaled with the burden. So let's take a look. Uh, have you, it, it, you'll notice that row-to-row -row timing is typically the problem with violence factor. If the front of the blast is properly moving, and as we get further back in the shot, the material starts moving more and more violently and vertically. And particularly, you'll notice this on the last set of holes. If the last set goes upward or the last couple holes go upward, it normally means there was not enough space for the material to move. And as long as we don't have too deep of a blast compared to the width and the burden, spacings, and amount of rock we're moving, that's normally an indication that the row to row timing is fast. And we're over confining the back holes of the shot. We'll take a look at a video here. You can see there that blow out of the holes, and particularly in the back, all of that went vertical. And that's due to insufficient row-to-row -row timing. And so violence factor is an easy-to-use tool that quickly assesses blasts. This is something that almost anyone can use, and all you need is a good video of the blast to start beginning to scale the amount of vertical movement of the rock. What violence factor is doing is it's assessing the cratering mechanism of a blast and giving you indications to how that blast is performing based on its breakage mechanism. We've also seen that with short benches or those with lower stiffness ratios, we tend to have higher violence factors even with the same pattern, same explosive, same means and methods. And we've seen that fast timing or over confinement of the blast is also going to lead to high violence factors because there's nowhere for that material to move and the only place it can go is up. And when that's the case, we don't have the ability to have flexural failure even occur. Our only option for breakage mechanisms is in cratering. And that concludes the uh, webinar here um, and, and my presentation specifically on violence factor. Thank you all for attending. And Kim, I'll give the floor back to you there if you have any uh, closing words. Thank you, Anthony, for your time mm -hmm. with us today. We really appreciate it. That was some great insights you offered. Uh, it seems like uh, useful, easy to calculate information. So thank you very much. Everybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to email either Dr. Konya, his information was just up on the screen, or you can email us at hello at strayos.com. Um, I uh, put it up in the chat box up above, so feel free to scroll up and go get it. We will, again, we will be sending copies of the webinar email, sorry, we will be sending copies of the webinar replay to the email that you use to register for this webinar. So keep an eye on your emails for those links. Um, you can also check out our YouTube channel. That's where we post everything. So if you liked this, uh, this webinar, you can check out some of our other webinars on our YouTube channel, including the presentation that Dr. Konya did for us uh, about half a year ago. Another absolutely great webinar. If you, uh, let's see what else. We have a hard stop at on the we have a hard stop so we can't spend much time today asking questions unless Dr. Konya you think you can get one or two in this time or do you want to just email them? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to here so um, mm -hmm. we can go through and send out emails with the responses to different questions that were asked. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much then. All right, guys, then keep an eye again on your emails and we will see the replay links and the question, the answers to your questions. If you want a certificate of attendance, certificate of completion, then also email us for that. Give us a little bit of time and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. If there are any topics you would like us to present on, feel free to send that to us as well. Uh, if anybody's interested in being a guest presenter, let us know. All right, thank you very much everybody for attending and thank you again, Dr. Konya. Until next month, see you all later. Thank you.